I think it's just so crazy. I don't, people don't realize that dietary choices you make shift your microbiome in real time, like almost instantaneously. And so if you look at the guts of people with very heavy plant-based diets, and then you look at the biome of carnivores, for instance, it's like they're vastly different, right? And you can really shift your biome in real time by the food choices you make and exercise and stress levels and all of these things vastly impact our microbiome and the microbiome is driving the show. Like that's, that's it. <laughs> that's yeah. end game is, is your microbiome. And so, so yeah. I'm, I'm one of those people that got put on antibiotics, like right out the shoot. I was born and I was sick and I was loaded with antibiotics my entire life. And so I'm, that's why I said earlier, I have all kinds of gut issues because I, I there's just no, like you, you're the only person I've heard say that fairly. People think that there's, some way to completely rehabilitate the gut in those cases. And I staunchly believe there's not, I've, I've, yeah. you know, you can, imp you know, I, I hang on as best I can. I'm doing pretty good, but like, I'll yeah. never have, my husband grew up on this farm and was never given antibiotics. And that man has the vitality and robustness of an <laughs> oxen, you know, and I just don't, I see it all the time. I'm like, man, I'd like his mitochondria. Yeah. <laughs> there, well, there you go. It is, uh, it's, it's seated early. I know I've heard, one thing I've heard some people in this space, because you know, I'm, gut microbiome is one that I would certainly not consider myself an expert, just a very engaged listener and uh, observer, follower. Um, but some of the people in that space, one of the things that uh, is that the gut microbiome is really seeded in the first thousand days of life. Yeah. And so if there's rapid antibiotic use that, that will have you know, some lasting effects, our, uh, our chief medical officer, who was really the lead uh, in the clinical development of MitoPure, uh, he, he originally grew up in India and then did his training in the U.S. and then Switzerland, and, and that's something he, you know, often says that that the, re the antibiotic use early on, he can't make a drop of urolithinase naturally and never will be able to. Yeah. Uh, so it, I think it is certainly something that's increasingly appreciated from quite literally birth through the rest of our life. Yeah. So let's talk about that process. Aging, just in general. Yeah. I mean, we know when our mitochondria start to peter out that aging increases rapidly. I'm sure you saw the study. I'm just throwing a wrench in here. I'm sure you saw the study recently where we age in bouts. So there's like a big one around 44 and there's another big one at 60. We're not aging linearly. We're aging in like, you know, there's, there's definitely some significant drops. Yeah. What are your, I just, just spitballing, like it doesn't, I know you have to follow the science, but <laughs> yeah, what's how, how, yeah, what's going on there? And like, how does that tie into this? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, could tie into that. I think biologically, I guess maybe to start with what the science says, we know there's that gradual decline. Pick any system, whether it's, or any system or it's performance. You know, we look at muscle strength, muscle mass, if we look at bone density, over time, it's going to slowly decline. That's inevitable for all of us. We're going to try to prevent that decline or keep it level or slow it as much as possible. But these chunks that we see, uh, there's a few thoughts I would have on that. Uh, and maybe one just to consider is the biology. So if we imagine that aging is a slow downward trajectory, there are going to be times in our life where our biology just knocks us down to a different level. Yeah. And I think a great example of that is woman going through menopause. Yeah. It is a true watershed moment for our bone and our density, right? And the role that estrogen and these really important hormones play in maintaining those systems, that's something where we'll see that sudden drop. If we look at just lifestyle factors, I think muscle's actually a great vehicle to look at this. Yeah. Because yes, we see this progressive decline, but what is really, really detrimental to people as they advance in age is not the slow decline, but it's when they encounter an event that causes a rapid decline. For aging individuals, this could be as simple as something like a three or four day, you know, bout of flu where they can't really get out of bed or maybe very limited moving around the house, that sudden drop in physical activity is enough to start to induce insulin resistance, to really 
shift that balance, that turnover that we talked about into a state of weakened muscles, atrophy, and metabolic consequences that if they were kind of aging and they maybe had 70% of that strength, this short instance can knock them down you know, to 60% of their strength. And then they continue the slow decline and they never fully recover. And this is something that you know, it is, has been studied uh, by many great labs. And of course, I'll shout out my, my PhD supervisor, Stu Phillips, who's really done a lot of great work in looking at this kind of detrimental drop off with instances of things like muscle immobilization. So speaking of Stu Phillips, something I love that he talks about, which fits in here is he, which I'm such a fan of, is the fact that recently on his social media, he's been kind of going up against this high protein conversation of everybody just eating, you know, tons and tons and tons of protein, which I understand. And it, it is important. And I'm a fan of adequate protein intake, but I'm a bigger fan of what he says, which is what matters more. And, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but what matters more is strength training and strength and getting in the gym and, and the actual spark and signal of doing that activity seems to trump whether or not you're getting adequate protein. Am I right on this? And how does that play in here? Because I feel like your A must be a player in there somewhere. No, you're absolutely right. It's short and simple exercise is the best thing we can do for our health span and longevity. And I, I can't say enough good things about Stu. I'm uh, forever grateful and indebted to him. Uh, but so, uh, the point of exercise versus protein, that is one where certainly exercise, if you had to pick one, eat enough protein, do exercise, you know, long-term we've, we've got to eat enough, but exercise is so potent that two things people don't realize is that almost no one exercises on less than a quarter of our population actually engages in any form of weightlifting exercise. And most people eat enough protein already. We don't necessarily think about it, but the average American is eating, you know, 1.1 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And that's pretty close to the recommendations of experts to have about 1.2 grams. So protein for most people isn't actually a concern, but the lack of physical activity is. When it comes to muscle, you're not going to build stronger or better muscles by eating more protein. You're going to do it by challenging your muscles. Yes. 